You didn't fly me to Hungary to have me stand here and stare at you. <laughs> he has a question. Excellent. Have you ever been hacked? The question is, has I ever been hacked? It's actually an interesting question because you, you know, the, the answer is no. And, and it's, it's often interesting to wonder why. Because right? you're a pretty big name in security, and you'd think that you know, some of you guys or somebody else would say, oh, it'll be fun, let's hack Bush Nair. I think it's because <laughs> I, I don't piss off people. <laughs> I mean, I think fundamentally, uh, I'm not, I don't, you know, I don't nag you, I don't taunt, I don't uh, complain about things, I don't complain about things, but I think, I think I'm pretty upfront and honest, and, and I think uh, people generally respect that. So no, I have not been hacked. I mean, I don't want to, want to take it as a challenge, because I'm, I think I'm pretty lucky, because you'd think I would be a target, but so far, so good. Uh, you're the only one asking questions, so go. Why are you not sure of that? Why are you sure of that? Question is, why am I sure of that? And actually, it's a, it's a good point. I suppose I'm not sure of it. I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. You, because, well, I mean, there are two reasons I'd be hacked, right? One is someone wants to steal money. So I kind of know because money was stolen. And the other is because someone wants to, uh, to brag about it. And I know because they bragged about it. I mean, you know, you, you, I suppose we can speculate whether any, uh, you know, international intelligence organizations like the NSA have hacked me. <laughs> and right, they wouldn't either steal money or brag about it, so I suppose I wouldn't know about that. Then they are, uh, then they then they ch choose the career. I think security is a mindset. There's a mindset to being a hacker, and you know, you might think of it as someone who says. You know, look at this, 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 and it, and it works. And the hacker would say, well, do that, and it doesn't work. And then the designer would say, well, don't do that. And, and the hacker would say, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that every day until you fix it. A hacker is someone, a security professional, is someone who looks at systems and how to break them. And not because they want to do malice, not because they're criminals, but because that's the way they think. Right? You think in terms of how do I get around the system? And to all of you, when you go through airport security, the first thing you think of is, well, how can I cheat this? Right? You don't do it, but that's how you think. And if someone thinks that way, they're a good security professional. And then after that, it's learning the facts, learning you know, computers or learning, I don't know, door guards or airplanes, or whatever, you know, whatever the, the, the domain of expertise is. But that mindset of looking at systems and, and figuring out naturally how to break them, I think is something you learn at an early age, probably because it's fun. I mean, this is why you'll see you know, hackers turn into good security people. I mean, hacking is just figuring out how things work. Once you do that, you figure out how they don't work. So I'm not convinced I chose security, so security chose me. Right, I entered this field sort of through mathematics. My career's been an endless series of generalizations. My first mathematical security, then computer security, and network security, and then security economics. And now I do more, mostly work in the psychology of security. You know, looking at how security and technology and people interact. You try to explain security to your mother. Right? That's what it's like. You know, not because your mother is dumb, because this isn't her area of expertise. And whether it's computer security or, I don't know, prescription drug safety, or airplane security, or building codes, I mean, these are specialized domains of expertise. And most people don't understand them. Now this is okay, this is the way our society works. Right? I don't understand anything about airplane safety. But I flew here on a Malev jet because I trusted whatever rules there were, regulations that, uh, you know, that surround airplane safety. I mean, we're all sitting here and we're not really worried this the roof is going to fall over our heads, even though this building is kind of questionable, right? <laughs> right? Because, not because we understand construction safety. Great. <laughs> right, but because we trust the building codes that have been in place, you know, since when, in the 50s, that it'll little, you know, build buildings that won't fall down. Now, computer security is no different. I mean, people aren't going to understand it. The problem we have, unfortunately, is we expect people to make security decisions on the internet. 
So they don't understand the threats, they don't understand the technology, yet we expect them to make smart decisions. And that's just, they, they just can't do that. Just like I can't make a smart decision about airplane safety. I just have to get on the airplane and trust. Right? You know, here's your computer, here's your network, you go, you know, go check your certificate. Your mother can't check your certificate. There's no certificate is. And and we have, we really can't expect her to. So this thing is state of awareness of security on the internet's low. But I don't think that's ever gonna change. I think we as designers need to build our systems to be secure even though there is no security awareness. <laughs> There's an essay on my website about why I, I don't encrypt my network. I, mean, I, I think it's I mean I think it's just polite to have an open network for people to use. Uh, right? <laughs> I don't care. I, I, mean, I secure uh, my computers, but you know, there's not a lot there. And doors, yeah, <laughs> secure doors. You know, it, it depends on where you live. I mean, and that's relatively recent. You know, a few generations ago, nobody locked their doors. The United States probably in Hungary either. You know, locking your door was was something that really was invented when the when cities be, uh, became you know came into form in really modern cities. So, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I tend to think that most people are pretty safe most of the time. And that, that sort of living a, a, a paranoid existence is, is, is more harm than good. Uh, you know, NATO is, is talking a lot about the United States is, Russia is, China is, Australia also. I, you know, I think in largely this is a mistake. I certainly think the military, the government needs to deal with government and military networks, but to put the government in charge of, you know, the civilian corporate personal network, I think does more harm than good. But this is going to be a battle in the upcoming years, and you watch it. In the United States, uh, the military is gaining more power, and it's the mil part of the military close around the NSA to surveil the network. To, uh, to, uh, you know, and to and to secure it. So I, I'm I, I'm not happy with this development. Countries too. The United States is doing a lot, but there is definitely serious espionage going on on the internet right now. I mean, national. And it, in China, it's less nationally sponsored, more nationally tolerated. And so there are hackers in China who. You know, don't take direction from the government, but they sort of know that if they find something good, they should let somebody know, and then they're left alone. So that, that's more common. You know, and, and, and this is getting to be a bigger de deal. I mean, I, I worry about it, because I think things are moving from passive espionage to active exploitation. I mean, it's one thing to break into a network and eavesdrop. It's something else entirely to break into a network and leave code that you can use at a later date to, uh, to cause damage. And I think that latter thing is happening more and more. I mean, the US is doing it, China's doing it, and probably other countries as well. So there is a worry this will get out of hand. You know, I, I've done a lot of writing. I think the whole cyber war threat is very overblown. But I think now is the time that, that nations should actually start working out cyber treaties. Cyber war treaties. You know what is permissible, what is not permissible. And these early days, I think, is a good time for nations to get together and do this. I don't think it's likely to happen, but I think it would be a good idea. You know the full disclosure debate. The question is when, when you, when one of you, you know, finds a vulnerability in a major piece of software, what, what should you do? Should you tell the vendor? Should you tell the world? Should you do something in the middle? Right. This is the full disclosure debate. You know, and, and to understand it, you sort of have to remember what happened before. You know, back in the early days, you know, the 80s, even, even the early 90s, when, when, when a researcher would find a, a software flaw, they'd alert the vendor, and the vendor would do nothing. For years. Right? Because why would they bother? And it's only when vulnerabilities are, are announced to the public do the vendor says, oh my god, I have to fix this. And they do. Right? So, so full disclosure, or at least the threat of full disclosure, is what keeps vendors honest. If we all said, we're not going to disclose vulnerabilities, we'll just tell the vendors, we're just gonna, we'll, we would just go back to the old ways. They, they, would, they wouldn't 
they would take their time fixing things. I will save for the next release, why bother? Right, so it is the, uh, it's the bad publicity that forces them to fix things. So that being said, you know, we've sort of, as a community, developed you know, a little more responsible ways of doing this. We, we will announce, we'll tell the vendor first, give them you know, a head start. So here's a vulnerability, you've got two weeks to fix it, I'm gonna go public, or I've got a month to fix it, you know, whatever, whatever you decide. And that seems to be a good compromise. But certainly, the disclosing vulnerabilities is how we get them fixed. That provides the economic incentive for the vendors to fix flaws. Uh, as banks implement better authentication or two-factor authentication or other security mechanisms, you see more active attacks. You see man-in-the-middle attacks. You see Trojans. Right? You see, so you see much more active attacks. You also see better targeted attacks. So instead of going after everybody, you pick a certain bank, a certain corporation, a certain person, right? and, and, and you target your attacks to them. And, and those, those are certainly more likely to work, especially as the banks build security against these lowest common denominator attacks. But the result is I don't think we're any safer, but the attacks look different. So those are the trends I see, and I think those will continue. I think the proportion of targeted active attacks will increase, right, as the security covers more of the passive general attacks. Uh, privacy certainly isn't dead. I think privacy is, sort of a, is a fundamental human need, that we all as people need privacy, right? We need to keep some of our thoughts to ourselves. We need to be able to write you know, letters to our loved ones and, and talk to our friends and, and tell our doctors things we wouldn't tell other people. And, and that's never gonna change. Now what is changing is, is how public people are. Now what's changing is social norms. You know, a lot of this depends on how old you are, you know, what you're used to. Right? But, you know, a little blinky red light that says, danger, don't copy this, your grandmother's going to say, oh, I can't copy it, red blinky light. Right? So anything will work against the amateur. I mean, even DHCP will still work against the amateur. Nothing will work against the professional. And that will always be true. Right? We can make it hard for the professional. DHCP was a hardware-only system. So it took a long time for someone to crack it. And because it's hardware only, you're not going to see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of software that'll, that'll allow you to get around it because someone has to build the hardware. I mean, it'll happen. I mean, what you'll probably see even for sale on the streets of Hong Kong in a few months. But it's still going to be sort of underground. You know, it, it's harder than software. But no, copy protection is fundamentally unsolvable. You know, it, it is a basic property of bits that they are copyable, and you cannot change that internationally that really, really want to discriminate traffic. They want to do it to uh, maintain monopoly on, on things they're doing and, and to, uh, to lock out other people. They want to do it to uh, be able to sell premium services. And they want to do it for uh, control. They want to do it for security reasons. They want to do it to stop file sharing. And, and, and you know, with all of that corporate might, it's increasingly hard to maintain the neutral stance. And we're still doing it, but I think we're losing the perception battle. So I'm not optimistic. And I wish I was more optimistic. I think, I think net neutrality is really important. I think it's what made the net great. And in an internet, in a world that changes so fast, when we don't know what the next thing is, we can't discriminate against it because we're going we're going to sacrifice our own future <laughs>